We, we've been having some weird technical things ever since the rain started last weekend. So you were you showed up on one screen and then you disappeared. So I thought maybe you washed away with the water. Well, I just I do want to say I hope everybody in your listening audience is staying safe in these sort of scary scary day today. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's tremendous. I I'm, don't know if you've seen the pictures of uh, in particular of the uh, water that's coming out of Bagnell Dam right now. Forty uh, at one point forty seven thousand cubic feet per second of water coming off the lake, uh, trying to uh, again get the lake level back down and. Uh, it's been a it's been a pretty rough time down here to say the least. Not as bad as uh, Pulaski County in the Waynesville area, but uh, it's been some uh, rough going. Well, I just hope everybody there is able to to stay safe. Well, absolutely, and we'll pass that along. Well, David, it is uh, time once again for us to uh, visit here on uh, Show Me at the Lake on News Talk KRMS. Two different things we're going to take up today. Let's start, first of all, voters went to the polls on Tuesday. Uh, Maybe a little bit better than expected turnout. About 15% of the electorate went to the polls, and uh, they uh, said yes to a, a tax increase in the Sunrise Beach Fire District. Yeah, not a surprise. The, the fire district seemed to do a good job in, in spreading the word about what the new taxes were for and getting out before the public and, and explaining the need for it. And, and also the, the size of the tax increase was very moderate. Uh, Seven cents per hundred dollars is, is not a large one. There were, there were fire districts and school districts around the state seeking much higher tax increases than, than seven cents. And a lot of them failed, especially in the St. Louis area. But at seven cents, a moderate tax increase where they did a good job of getting the word out. I'm I'm not surprised it passed, and I think it'll probably do some good things for the region. Yeah, and tax increases are always tough to talk about. We spent part of uh, hour number one talking with Camden County Sheriff Dwight Franklin, and uh, he was mentioning how you know their budget gets slashed every single year, and that's something you hear again and again from different government departments is that you know they need money, but then on the other hand, you uh, you go to your taxpayers and. That's something that uh, it doesn't matter whether it's five cents or whether in some cases some of the uh, increased proposals this week were, I think, uh, looking at 20, 25 cents in different places in the state. Uh, right now, people just don't want to hear about tax increases. Well, the, well, they'll hear about it in some yeah. cases, but well. if you don't make your case, <laughs> yeah. it's too large, they're going to say no. And, and they should. And there were a lot of things turned down around, around the state, uh, probably more so than usual. I think that had to do with... Outside of Sunrise Beach, a lot of these tax increases were very large. And when people start calculating how much it's going to increase their bill, when when that increase gets over three digits and you're talking in the hundreds all of a sudden, I mean, people really stop and, stop and think, as they should. That's what the Hancock Amendment requires in Missouri. And as somebody who believes that governments, most governments can do a better job of, of tightening their belt and spending their money more wisely, I think it's good that taxpayers are holding them accountable. Is it usual uh, in this day and age when you talk about tax increases, is it usual for a public safety entity to maybe do better at the polls than, say, other government agencies? Well, I think so. I think one of the reasons for that is that with with public safety entities, you don't have to convince the voters that what you're doing is a core function of government. I mean, we'll all agree that that a fire and, and police and sheriff services and 911 are a core function of government. So you don't have to spend any time trying to convince people of really why you're doing it. You can just try and explain what you're doing and that you're doing it as as well as you can and and why you need this money. But but as much as you know, in other parts of the state. There have been many, many controversies about fire districts. We haven't really seen that in the Ozarks. But there are plenty of stories of of fire districts with with tax rates too high for what they for what they produce and with political problems involved with them. So in other parts of the state you see fire district tax increases get shot down sometimes. But a lot of that is due to poor management in those districts. And as I said, as I've said, you know, we haven't really seen that in the Ozark community, thankfully. And uh, primarily the, the increase is uh, also uh, one of the things we did uh, spend a lot of time talking with Sunrise Beach Fire Chief Dennis Riley about is that, uh, you know, he poured over different numbers, looked at different formulas, looked at uh, all kinds of things to come up with the, the rate increase uh, that uh, he uh, proposed to the voters. And uh, the voters, uh, was 58 percent, were in approval of that uh, on Tuesday. Well, that's 
definitely a message. I mean, 58% of the people are saying, you know, they, they heard the message. They know we're going to get additional firemen for our community and more people on staff most of the time. And for this, I'm going to have to pay an extra $13 a year for a $100,000 house. So figure it out accordingly from your, from your own house's value. And I think, obviously, 58% of the voters said that's a trade-off worth having for me. We're talking with David Stokes here on the Morning Magazine on News Talk 1115-975 KRMS. The other thing we did want to spend some time uh, discussing here this morning is uh, something that uh, we have had on our news here. It is uh, something that uh, came up at a Lake Ozark Board of Aldermen meeting a few weeks back. Uh, and it looks like everything is uh, green-lighted, at least uh, on the city's end. And now we'll see what the developer does moving forward. But uh, possibly the addition of some uh, more affordable um, income housing coming into uh, the city of Lake Ozark. Well, I love the fact that more affordable housing is coming is coming in. What I don't like is the fact that it, like like most low-income housing projects in Missouri, is going to be subsidized by the taxpayers. Our state's low-income housing tax credit is the single largest tax credit the state has. I mean, in the most recent fiscal year, they issued $165 million in tax credits. That's other people's money to developers of low-income housing. And this, for a state, Missouri, it was, we, we do not have expensive housing in the state of Missouri. We are one of the most affordable housing states in our, both of our large cities, and, and most of this state has affordable housing. Subsidizing it, to the extent we do, is just nuts. And as much as I want, think this low-income housing should go forward and it shouldn't be blocked by any type of zoning or anything else, the subsidies we give to these programs are just crazy. Now, if a project like this then doesn't go after one of these tax subsidies, uh, the next logical question is, well, are there other ways they can get funded then? Yes, they can be funded by going to the bank and taking out a loan and charging rents to, <laughs> to cover the, the cost of developing it. They can be developed the way that most businesses are, are developed and have, have historically been. The idea that every retail center or every low-income housing development needs to be subsidized well unfortunately that's where we've gotten in missouri we use tax credits and local subsidies so extensively it's now in every developer's mindset that it's just part of the equation and you assume it and it should not be that way we don't have to subsidize all these things missouri does not have a problem with overly expensive housing we're actually one of the more affordable housing states out there and we do not need to be spending $165 million a year to, to build something that if there's a market need for it, the market can meet. As you look then uh, at, at different projects, and we're not just, uh, again, just talking about the one here at Lake Ozark, but uh, you mentioned that this goes on uh, throughout this state. Is it a situation of where uh, developers just look at the maybe the easy economic development tools instead of perhaps maybe thinking of the more conventional ways? I mean, you've already mentioned a bank, but other ways that they can get these projects funded? Right. They, they do it because they can. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, the old... It's there. It's it's out there, and it's not hard for them to go and to go and get. And the story in the Lake Ozark Business Journal talks about how it's a competitive process for it. And I guess that's a good thing, but it's it's not so competitive that they don't give out just a ton of money each year for it. And unfortunately, like retail developers and TIF and and so many other types of subsidies, the mindset has changed in Missouri in the last 20 years where now these types of subsidies are assumed for these projects. They're no longer the exception, they're the rule. We, we go around and highlight the rare Walmart development in the state that doesn't have a tax subsidy. That's, that's the man-by-dog story, unfortunately. It should be the other way around. Now, with uh, a lot of these different projects happening, all of this, uh, again, you know, you mentioned in excess of $150 million. Is this something the state House or state Senate might try to change in the future? I certainly hope so, and there are people in the state house and state senate who are trying to change it. Now, the governor has appointed this tax credit review commission over the past couple of years, and they've issued some excellent guidelines on tightening up the the many different tax credit programs that Missouri has, and just eliminating some completely, and and tightening others such as historic preservation and low income housing, which Missouri is among the most generous in the country on in both. But unfortunately, it just these improvements 
there's been some minor improvements made to tax credits in the state in the past year or so, but nothing substantial. And we really need to. It's, people need to remember that this is your money. This is real tax dollars. This is money that is taken from somebody else and the state decides to give it to a developer of low-income housing. And that's just not right. It's addressing a need that Missouri doesn't have. Let's hold on to that thought here. I'm going to ask you to hold on the line for me. Oh, I was going to ask you to hold on the line because I had our uh, meteorologist checking in, and I think they're going to do that again here. And nope, they did not. So we'll see if they check back in. We've got a flood warning that uh, just came across the wire, so I believe that's why they may be checking in. So if we get interrupted here, that's uh, that's the reason here. Uh, let's go back into tax credits a little bit. That's been something that's been bounced around the halls of Jefferson City for so many years, is there going to be uh, somebody that, that kind of takes the lead at some point and goes, well, you know, not that all tax credits are bad because there are some beneficial ones, but the fact that the state has so many, is there a way that those can be cleaned up, uh, trimmed up, uh, made to work more efficiently? You know, there are certainly elected officials in Jefferson City who are trying to do that. The Tax Credit Review Commission, appointed by Governor Nixon, had many excellent suggestions. And there are, there are some senators who have been fighting for years now to, uh, to reduce the use of tax credits in the state. Uh, Senator Brad Lager from northwestern Missouri is one who, who stands out there. And I think there's a general consensus that something needs to, to be done. But the unfortunate fact is that with the exception of not renewing the distressed area land assemblage tax credit, which had been used extensively by only one person in the state, uh, that didn't get renewed, thankfully, last year. But other than that, we haven't had significant reform because uh, I'm not one to, to blame powerful interests for a lot. But in this case, there are a lot of powerful lobbies out there that get a lot out of the various tax credits. There's the financial lobby, the legal lobby, the, of course, the development lobby, uh, union workers who, who benefit from the work. There's a lot of people who've got a lot of interest in this, and so far they've been successful at preventing reform. It will be, uh, again, something to watch here as uh, we get closer to this next legislative session to see what uh, bills are already possibly being considered. It just, uh, for whatever reason, it just seems like they, they are discussed, they go through committees, but uh, they end up dying on either the uh, floor of the House or Senate. They do, unfortunately. There are, there are, look, the, the low-income housing developers around the state, they, they, they get an enormous amount from this. And the developers use the historic tax credits and then the, the state and more commonly local TIFs. I mean, we discuss so many of these alphabet soup of subsidies on this show. It, it goes on and on in Missouri. And Missouri does use many of these programs more than other states. It's not like we're just in the middle of the pack doing what everybody else does. We use TIF and historic tax credits and the like a great deal comparatively, and it's way too generous. It is other people's money, and the problem, as I said a few minutes ago, is it's now assumed. It's not the exception. It's the rule, and we need to change that. And I, I say that as somebody who hopes that a low-income housing pro program project goes in in the Ozarks if it's needed, but the market should demand it and require it, not subsidies. David Stokes with the Show Me Institute. As always, thank you so much for the visit here on this week's edition of Show Me at the Lake. Please give us your uh, website information and then also your information if people have more questions or are interested in finding out more about the Show Me Institute. Thanks, Manny. You can find all of our work at showmeinstitute.org. You can follow me on Twitter at David C. Stokes. I just hope everybody in the area is staying safe in this difficult flash flood period. Thank you so much for the visit, David. We'll visit again next Thursday here on The Morning Magazine. Thanks, Manny.